With its sudden and unprecedented popularity with young people and outrage from old people in the early to mid 90s, the Mortal Kombat franchise quickly began to expand in new and unexpected ways. There were toys, cartoons, comics, references all over pop culture. You can do your shopping at home? Or play Mortal Kombat with a friend in Vietnam! And a theatrically released movie. Don't worry, we'll get to that one. We'll get to all of it. So the games naturally had to start evolving as the series' popularity grew. And one year after the movie, Mortal Kombat finally made the leap to 3D consoles, such as the Space Station 1 and the Neverendo 67. After cementing itself so firmly in the world of gaming and cultural consciousness, Transitioning from digitized actors to a 3D system seems like it'd be rather easy, right? Oh boy. I think it's safe to say out of the three games made for MK in this era, all of them are just not games. All right, before we get back to the fun stuff, I gotta get these out of the way. We gotta talk about this beautiful disaster and its two adjunct parasitic tumors. So the PlayStation 1 era of gaming is when cinematic storytelling in games was really starting to take a foothold. It was an expectation now to have voice acting, cutscenes, lore, the works. While it worked really well for some games, others struggled to function that way. Usually if one thing was good, there was always another part that was iffy. Like games with great lore and world building and even fantastic level design. But the voice acting and cutscenes are... <laughs> and games with good voice acting, but the cutscenes lacked a little graphically. Games with gorgeous cutscenes, but the voice acting, that was... So it's not to say MK4 was the only game around this time struggling to give you the full package, but the team behind it really didn't have that much experience with any of these new concepts. So... All of it is bad. Voice acting is all over the place, the cutscenes are a mess, and the graphics are about standard for PS1, which ironically feels a step down from what they had before, despite being a more primitive method of creating characters. Well, to start, the gameplay is serviceable. It plays about how a normal MK game plays, but the animations are a little silly and certain things look too fast. Apparently this is because Ed Boon worried that motion capturing and keyframing the actors based on real martial artists would actually make the gameplay too different from your standard Mortal Kombat game. Because obviously a motion captured real life punch moves differently than a two frame digitized animation of a punch. So they used the motion capture method and then changed the speed of these moves to make them feel more like the 2D games. So, yes, it's a realistic motion of a punch, but it's sped up in the same amount of frames as the digitized fighters. The result is just something looking unrealistic, but also not unrealistic enough to be fun. Let's not also forget to mention that these stages are very plain looking and really didn't need to be in 3D since they look the same from every direction. This is the first of quite a few MK games to use a 3D arena, so you have the revolutionary ability to just sidestep attacks. You and your opponent can sidle around in the backgrounds and find stuff to throw at each other, or... Well, yeah, that's about it. It kind of makes you wonder why they even built the game like this. Was it just because other games from around the time were doing it and it was like a peer pressure thing? Was it because they started working in a 3D engine and thought that had to be taken as literally as possible and it wouldn't count as 3D unless you could waddle into the foreground and background? It's just kind of gimmicky and doesn't really add anything. Which applies to a lot of things in this game, actually. Like the weapons! For the first time in an MK game, you can intentionally whip out a weapon to stab poke your opponents with. Although you'll be hard pressed to get lucky enough to use the thing because you drop it if they hit you first. Then they can pick it up and use it against you. Which I guess was their attempt at balancing the game, but like, come on. Wait, hold on. Why are weapons even allowed in Mortal Kombat? Isn't there a rule against that? It's kind of unfair when a guy can just pull out a gun and shoot everyone. That's not a test of warrior skill, that's just cheating, man. Or, or what about the guy that's like 9 feet tall and has a giant warhammer? Can we put in some kind of weight class system to make him more fair? You know, cause like, Liu Kang weighs like 105 pounds, it seems a little unbalanced. It, it, is, there, is there a handbook I can read on the rules? This is the first game in the series to use alternate costumes and that's... kinda cool? Some of them actually stuck and appear in later games, like Johnny's suit, Sub-Zero's frozen limbs, and this mix of Reptile's classic and scaly designs. For some reason in this game, he's considerably more... reptilian. Probably because they went overboard with the ninjas in the last game. I think this one has by far the most annoying and hard to pull off fatalities. 
Something about it just doesn't seem to work. I can't figure out where to stand to do it right. I'm sure one of you MLG bros will tell me it's because I suck, right? Yeah, okay, thanks. I know it's very important to be good in Mortal Kombat 4. It's a cornerstone of gaming culture, after all. Anyway, if you do manage to do a fatality, you'll find the sound effects of blood evoke a garden hose splashing on concrete, rather than the sound of arterial spray. <laughs> Speaking of culture, these cutscenes sure are something to behold. Our story starts with Raiden standing in the rain and talking to, to, to no one, I guess. Just kind of going off. He says that a few thousand years ago, one of the Elder Gods went rogue and started committing god crimes and trying to take over all the different realms. And after a few genocides and retaliation, Raiden helped to banish him to the Nether Realm, which is where Scorpion lives. After Shao Kahn is defeated in MK3, Shinnok gets some help from his buddy Quan Chi, a sorcerer who had seen the film Powder the previous year and got way too into it. They escape the Heather Realm and take over Katana's home dimension with the power of this magic amulet MacGuffin that we'll be fumbling around with for the next six games plus a prequel, so get used to that. The story of this game is kind of funny because there's not really like a tournament anymore. It ended when they beat Shao Kahn. It's, it's gone. This is pretty much just people from Mortal Kombat being drafted to fight a bad guy that's taking over the multiverse because Raiden needs people who are good at fighting. This will become a big theme for the rest of the series. The N64 version of the game had these... You wish to beg for mercy from your new master, the Lord Shinnok? Never, sorcerer! <laughs> Wonderfully animated cutscenes using the in-game models and environments due to limitations in memory. But the PlayStation port really went all out and took it a step further with these gorgeous FMVs. Never! Needless to say, these cutscenes aren't any better in CG animation. Let's talk about a few of my favorites, shall we? So I only played this game twice as Scorpion and Sub-Zero, and I got both their endings. Both endings are basically the same scenario, where they fight and then discover that Quan Chi just tricked Scorpion into doing that because he hated Sub-Zero's older brother so much due to prequel shenanigans. But only the Scorpion one is canon because he doesn't kill Quan Chi in that one. And also, why did Quan Chi want revenge on younger Sub-Zero for the shit his brother did if he already knows that Scorpion revenged him for something else? For some reason in Scorpion's ending, Sub-Zero talks in an Arnold Schwarzenegger impression. The battle is finished. Your quest for vengeance is over, Scorpion. But in his own, he doesn't? Your soul will never rest, Scorpion. The Lin Kuei may have been responsible for your murder, but your family's true killer still remains free. And in the N64 version of Sub-Zero's ending, Scorpion says, Our battle is finished. You are now freed from my curse. Live well, the Quay warrior. And then Sub-Zero says, I, did, I didn't add that. That's not a glitch because they, they, they even put a subtitle for that. What is that? What is that? In Sonya's ending, she tricks Jarek into falling off a cliff. In Jarek's ending, Sonya tricks Jarek into falling off a cliff, but then he throws her off of the cliff. And then in Jax's ending, Sonya tricks Jarek into falling off of a cliff, but then he throws her off of the cliff. Then Jax throws Jarek off the cliff again just to make sure that it sticks. None of these are canon. In Reptile's ending, he asks for a favor and then Shinnok says no. Infidel! Reiko sits on a throne and then puts on Shao Kahn's old helmet. A later game reveals the lore that this is just a thing that he does, and he isn't actually ruler of Outworld, nor is he secretly Shao Kahn, he just, he, he just sneaks in there and plays pretend, that's it. His N64 ending just has him wordlessly walk into a portal, probably because they didn't want to make an extra in-game asset for the chair or the helmet. What a banger of an ending, 10 out of 10. Johnny Cage's ending is the best in the game because it appears to have nothing to do with anything in the story and it's just, it's funny. Liu Kang gets a Force Ghost call from Kitana asking him to come be the permanent immortal ruler of a peaceful realm called Adena. Adena- Ah, God, fucking. Ah! Liu Kang gets a Force Ghost call from Kitana asking him to come be the permanent immortal ruler of a peaceful realm called Adenia as her husband. But then he's like, nah. I cannot accept your offer. It's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for him. Liu Kang is dead. <laughs> so obviously the story for this game lacks something to be desired, but then again, that might be due to the problem that would start plaguing the rest of the Mortal Kombat series from this point forward until like 19 years later. 
this series doesn't know how to make new characters anymore. While the first two games seemed to generate nothing but memorable and interesting characters, and MK3 threw in a few duds, but even they had some charm, MK4 is just sad about it. It's like they didn't even try. Look at these guys. They're just so boring to even look at. Their names are boring, their moves are boring, their faces are boring. While I respect the restraint from just creating an infinite spectrum of color-coded ninjas with thematically corresponding superpowers, the new ideas just didn't seem to work. No one gravitates towards these guys. No one thinks they're interesting. Kai is just Liu Kang's friend that can also fight. That's it. Reiko is a guy who doesn't talk and has face paint like Nightwolf, I guess. He was apparently supposed to be Noob Saibot, but fans complained about too many ninja characters and Noob being too hard to see in some stages. So they just changed his outfit and went, hey look, it's a new guy! Which isn't a new thing, but this time it's not excusable because those had unique personality and were justifiable because they were the result of technical limitations. This was just a lack of creativity. Tanya is there to complete the female ninja set of color swaps and her personality is that she's a traitor or something. Jarek is exactly identical to Kano in every way, even in terms of his place in the story. He has Kano's moves and even his fatalities. And he's from the same fictional gang as Kano. But they just took out his cyborg parts because he was Kano. And then at the last minute they decided they wanted to make a new character. Why does he have a single laser eye then? Because Kano taught him that trick. It's just a thing you can teach people. Kano runs an online course for it. Fujin! Alright, so like, you know how Raiden is the god of thunder, Fujin is the god of wind. That's all you gotta know. He's just his elemental co-worker. With the exceptions of Quan Chi and Shinnok, who both have memorable designs and character traits, the new roster is just full of bland new additions. It's just four normal looking dudes with vaguely old European or vaguely old Asian clothing. What happened to all the creative and wacky ideas? We got a cyborg mercenary, a ghost rider ninja, a guy who can kill people with a magic hat, and now we have fucking Kai. These characters are so forgettable that I actually got them mixed up earlier and kept calling Jarek Reiko and had to rewrite my script to fix it. Maybe the series' lead character designer John Tobias was getting burnt out at this point and didn't bring his A-game because this was the last mainline entry in the series he worked on. But the thing that really pushed him over the edge was... Uh, what are you guys working on next? Is there an MK5 game? Definitely. MK5. Yeah. How about yourself, John? Uh, then we're also working on a game called uh, Mortal Kombat Special Forces, which stars Sonya. Hi. Hi. <laughs> well, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Anyway, it was a fun callback to reveal Goro was still alive, and just as much of a cheater as ever. But the final boss was laughably easy, and didn't pose much of a threat. This is the only game in the series to give you limited lives during the challenge ladder, and I can only imagine this as being implemented as a method of keeping kids from hogging the machine at the arcade. I set those to the maximum amount because goddammit this is 2019 and the only reason to go to an arcade is to make my 11 year old sister play House of the Dead. MK4 is sort of a game that didn't need to exist, it's full of half-baked ideas that all just say, well I guess we should put this in now. Between the new story, new characters, new gameplay mechanics, and new costumes, they all just kind of fall flat and I don't think they knew how to pull it off. Or had access to the technology at the time to make it really work. I think the biggest misstep was the decision to stop using digitized actors because look at these same character designs in the trailer for the game. They had a budget for costumes now, they should have just used these guys, what a waste. Though pretty much every game after MK4 in the series would use it as an influence and thankfully incorporate its ideas in a much better way, it's what I consider a real low point for Mortal Kombat. So let's make an extended edition on a console no one wanted that stopped being produced after three years. Mortal Kombat Gold is just like Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3. More characters added to fill out a lackluster roster and that's about it. Thankfully, they brought back plenty of classics, and there's some neat new lore added in these extra endings, like Goro becoming a good guy, Cyrax becoming a human again, and Sector hip-thrusting everyone to death because Sonya left the door to the lab open. Damn it, Sonya! Do you want wild cyber ninjas just walking right in? 3 out of 10. Too much emisamagadabada. So shortly after that embarrassing train wreck, Midway decided they wanted to branch out and start experimenting with other types of games set in the Mortal Kombat universe. Fatality. Because that's just ridiculous. No one beats Sub Zero. Sub -Zero. When 
thing led to another, and we have a spin-off prequel about Big Brother Sub-Zero. Brings back digitized actors in both gameplay and the cutscenes. The bones of your arch nemesis, and leader of Scorpion's Ninja Clan. <laughs> yeah, I love it like this. That was some gangster shit, baby. Quan Chi has once again retained your services. Yeah, but you're gonna have to pay me. A small amulet. Worthless to you, but let's just say it has great sentimental value to me. It's an action-adventure story about Noob Subbot, who was hired by Quan Chi to steal that magic medallion thing in the first place. And along the way, we get to see how Scorpion was killed. It's funny how this is such a massively important moment in the series, and it's only ever visually represented in the game through such a basic little animation. Like, 60% of the lore revolves around this spine rip. Anyway, Quantico Chi wipes out Scorpion's clan in exchange for Sub-Zero going to this big fortress full of elemental warriors. Because of Sub-Zero's powers, he's apparently the only guy who can fight said elemental warriors, and also Quan Chi just didn't want to go himself because he's a wuss. Ironically, I think these cutscenes are the most charming and interesting part of this game, which is a far cry from MK4. The acting is cheesy in the most lovable way, and they got back actors from the previous MK games, like the guy who played Kano. And this is the same Sub-Zero from MK3. Plus, I just really like the costumes. I used this Sub-Zero costume as a reference when I made my own ninja cosplay with the help of my mom and grandma when I was about 12. It still fits, actually. Anywho, this game has plenty of characters to fight, one of which is the Wind God guy from MK4, and another is this Serena lady who shows up in later games since you have the option to spare her after her boss. Sir, a mortal has escaped from the... A mortal? Yes, a mortal. He is headed towards the gates of immortality. Alert the keepers and send a full garrison to intercept. Make sure that he does not cross the branch. We have toyed with the ninja long enough. She'll even show up in the final boss to help you kick Quan and the cheese. Sub-Zero gets yelled at by disappointed Dad Raiden for giving this spooky-looking drug dealer the MacGuffin coin, so he sends him to hell to get it back. Subba Bubba stops more bad guys and then even has another run-in with Scorpion. You better lock me up, cause otherwise you dead. You go show up, bitch. Don't bother worrying about escape. I'm not in the mood for your bullshit. I am Scorpion. You killed me in cold blood. Hey, my bad. You could have let me live. Give me a break, bitch. I'm sorry. Don't make me say it again. But my clan and family would still be alive. Yeah, G, what? It wasn't enough to kill me. You had to destroy every last remnant of my being, including my wife and child. You want me to blast you, fool? You want to hold in your head, fool? Get the army, I'm a fucking maniac! Words will not save you, Lin Kuei warrior. You're about to get your face black, fool. You fucked up right now. Unfortunately, Sub-Zero's new ally, Serena, gets killed by Shinnok, but in the MK, getting killed is just more of an inconvenience, so she'll be fine. Shinnok's design in this game is even less intimidating than the last one, but after you make him really mad, he turns into a giant super-powered monster. That's my no. cash now, boy! No. No. Hey, I ain't got time for this shit. This spot is bullshit. This is a thing he does, apparently. I find myself really wanting to like this game because the concept is great. Just taking the stage borders off the player and letting you continue forward like a side-scroller is really neat. And the story is interesting to me. Hell, I think the graphics even look pretty great. But then there's a major setback. The gameplay. I don't think I can say much about it that other bigger channels haven't covered, but the platforming in this game is a nightmare train wreck that makes it almost impossible to enjoy. All this game's potential is killed by its brain-dead decision to think D-pad jumping could work for this type of level design. And you have Frosty Ninja Man trying to make pinpoint accurate jumps on teaspoon-sized platforms. You know how you jump in Mortal Kombat to either get away from an opponent or dive kick them in the face? It's not exactly a precision move, it's just about being offensive or defensive. You can't just apply that to a side-scroller level and expect the game to work exactly the same as Mario. It's not built for that. So even though this game has some really awesome boss characters, you'll never be able to find them unless you use the level select cheats or you're just crazy enough to spend a few dozen hours trying to get past these stupid wind temple sections. 
I wish someone could just make a mod for this game to just take out the majority of the platforming sections. To make matters worse, your ice powers are limited and can run out eventually, which makes everything even harder. Why on earth did we need some kind of inventory system? How about you just get more health when you successfully kill an opponent? So if you combatize every enemy in the level before the boss, you'll be good and ready to take them on instead of having to stock up on health potions. At the very least, you can use the switch directions button to make him do a funny dance. I can't fault Midway for trying new things, but they just didn't go far enough out of their comfort zone with this one. But I still find things about this game really cool, but just not having the patience to really sit down and struggle through it. Games are supposed to be fun, not a chore. Apparently people in the late 90s felt pretty much the same about this game that I did, so a couple of planned mythologies games about other characters like Liu Kang, or Baraka Paraka Barak Baraki Broccoli Your Trash Brock Spock The Rock Maraka Doc Ock Falarka and Aparka were cancelled. But Jack's got one. Why does it smell like a Dan Ford and catchphrase in here? This is where the Mortal Kombat franchise became irreparably damaged when one of the biggest creative voices behind it felt so stifled and beaten down by developing this game that he left the series behind forever and they had to awkwardly cut around him in the documentary footage for later MK games. This game had a legendarily troubled development over the course of three years. While one half of the duo behind the series, Ed Boon, worked on Mortal Kombat 4 and Gold, John Tobias was saddled with this project. Over the course of working on the game, Tobias and the team working under him found themselves struggling to build a fully 3D experience because it was so far out of their wheelhouse. It was a massive undertaking for them to make this thing, and as it took more and more time, Tobias saw the end of the PlayStation 1, N64, and Dreamcast coming over the horizon as the new millennium approached. He found himself wanting to work on a big budget game for the new consoles with a more capable team. So four years after Mortal Kombat 4, in 1999, he left Midway to start his own company, which was equally as unsuccessful as this game. This left the team for Special Forces kind of discombobulated and unsure how to even finish this beast of a project. So they scrapped most of their more ambitious ideas and rushed out an incredibly shallow, basic, and underwhelming final product on the PlayStation. They didn't even bother porting it to the other two systems like they intended to originally. They just gave up. But enough about the behind the scenes mess, you guys want to know about the game itself, and honestly, it disappointed me. I feel like this one kind of hit meme status for how bad it is, and I've heard people talk about it as if though it's one of the worst games ever made, but it's not even that noteworthy, it's just kind of lame. For one, the story is extremely absent. Kano breaks his clan of bad guys out of jail, including Jarek, his biggest fan as we know, and a bunch of more generic bosses and another Ninja Palette Swap character. The last one we'll see in this series, actually, because I guess brown is the only color they hadn't used yet. So Jax decides to chase them down from hideout to hideout, and then inevitably chases Kano to Outworld, discovering that he wanted to go there to get this mystical gem of immense power. Turns out that power is just to teleport you back to Earth. <laughs> Fucking idiot. This is apparently the first story in the entire canon of the Mortal Kombat universe, despite the massive continuity errors hanging from Jax's shoulder stumps. The gameplay is kind of slow and clunky. If you're using the D-pad to move around, you almost feel like you're walking on a grid and the enemies stop you dead in your tracks just by hitting you. But I found out if you turn on the joystick control, the game becomes laughably easy because you can pretty much just outmaneuver everyone and just bash them in the head. Not to mention, you can find a silly amount of ammo lying around to take everyone out at a distance. There's also a handful of special moves that you can use to do a lot of damage, but who needs that when you have a machine gun that never needs reloading? You can zoom in and shoot from a first person kind of angle, but it's only really ever useful in one part of the game and the auto-aim tracks so well in the third person that you'd never really need it. The levels range from relatively simple linear jaunts to maze-like labyrinths of low-poly walls that all look the same. Every level seems to introduce a new mechanic and then forget it exists when the next level rolls around. Then maybe it'll come back like two or three levels later. Like using these detonators to blow up walls and reveal secret passages. That just stops being a thing after a while. Or this mechanic for pushing boxes? You only use that once. 
You only need to climb up on top of something twice in the whole game. You have an inventory menu for some reason despite only getting like two key items at most in a single time, so all it does is give you a brief respite from the bosses hitting you to heal up before getting back to the COMBAT with a K. It's easy to get lost in these levels if you have a bad sense of spatial awareness, and a map would have been really helpful at times. But I still managed to navigate my way through these dark and drab areas with ease during a special voice chat session with my patrons. I'm gonna start doing those every two weeks now, so if you want a chance to talk with me while I play crappy games like this one, it's only a dollar away. Speaking of selling out, this game! The bosses are all relatively easy. They use some kind of special attack that hurts at a distance, but as soon as you get in close, they can't really do anything to stop you. If you have the ammo to spare, you can just post up in the corner and unload on them from a distance. The machine gun stuns them so hard they get locked in place and can't do anything until you're done firing. My favorites in the game are Jarek because he's just so sad it's funny, and Tremor because he's the only one that's kinda cool. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Color swap ninjas are cool, man. I can't help but notice this is the first time we see Kano post Mortal Kombat movie and his design and voice are trying to match his film actor. So what happens when a low budget, cheesy, overacted 90s movie character is translated into a cheesy, low budget 90s PS1 game character? Bad things. It's a shame that he was a victim of the silent killer that is male pattern baldness before the first game's story. <laughs> This boss fight is sad. Um, I guess that counts as a fatality since he exploded. I found a video online where someone posted rare footage from a much earlier build of the game. Remember how they said Sonya was going to be in it? Well, Sonya was going to be in it. She was fully playable in her own concurrent levels separate from the ones with Jax. And then, for some reason, she was totally removed later in development. It's kind of weird though, because Jax talks to some lady named Gemini on the radio between missions. And it would have been really easy to just change her name to Sonya so we at least know she exists. Instead of just not mentioning her at all. The older version has all in-game cutscenes, and if you can look past the hideous, texture-clipping PS1-style character models, these are kind of impressive from a technical standpoint just because of how complex they are. There's also a lot of voice acting. These guys chased us around the world. They want their nuke back. I say we give it to them and get them off our tails. You're going soft on us, Cabal, huh? We just massacred a whole squad of Special Forces goons, and you want to just give up and give them back that toy? You know what that gadget's worth? 500, 600 million. And apparently even more characters were planned to be included, like Cabal prior to getting his homeless Darth Vader makeover. The writing is... What do you want now? I have to use the toilet. So use the toilet. There's one in your cell. But I can't. My hands are cuffed. I ain't taking off your cuffs. Well, then can you at least come in and pull my pants down for me? Uh... It needs some work. If we take a look at the gameplay they had originally, it's almost completely different. This had a more dynamic camera that followed along behind the player, bigger and more complicated levels, a jumping and climbing mechanic, and just better looking animations. Color me impressed. I know this is unfinished, but it still looks leagues better than what we got, I think this would have pushed the PlayStation to its technical limits just to run. It's a shame we never got this game. Considering how different the released product is from the demo, you have to wonder just what the hell happened behind the scenes that led to such a drastic change. Some people theorize that the team behind the game trashed all of this save for the character models and just started over from scratch after Tobias left in 1999. Which means the 2000 release game would have been made in less than a year just to finally have it be done with. Thus ends what I have affectionately titled in my project files as Mortal Kombat's... Uh, that. Mortal Kombat went from owning the gaming world, to being the reason the gaming world was so controversial for a time, to just being another franchise with no clear direction and too much demand for sequels. There's a very ugly period of history in the late 90s and early 2000s where this series struggled to evolve alongside the technology of its time. 
Midway tried all kinds of ambitious new ideas in three different ways, they just fell flat because they either didn't know how to use the gaming techniques of their time, didn't know how to build upon what they had already established as functional, or just didn't know how to reinvent their series in a satisfying way. And we're pushing around so many polygons and the detail is so incredible and the realism is so incredible, but that still wasn't enough. Before we talk about the new era of MK's game installments, I think it's important to focus on that word, franchise. Because this became so much more than just a few games. This was a pop cultural phenomenon that blew up in a wave of different products, adaptations, and merchandising. Next time, I think it could be fun to sidetrack for a while and talk about every other Mortal Kombat thing from the 90s. So real quick, who's your favorite character out of all the Mortal Kombat's? Scorpion, absolutely. Scorpion? Uh, visually, I'd say Goro. Goro? Reptile. Well, I gotta tell you guys, this is my favorite right here. Yeah, that's nice. Get the microphone out of my face. Sorry, 